So here's a recap of what we talked about today in class regarding open sets, continuous functions, and sort of the three faces of continuity. First thing we did was talk about graphs and how the intuition that we want for continuous functions is we want a definition which reflects the idea that the graph of a continuous function should be just as unbroken as the real line itself. In other words, it can't be like the rational numbers or it can't be like the integers where there are gaps in between them. Uh, we want it to have that nice completeness property. Um, we want the, the domain of a function and the graph of a function to have that completeness property. So it's not ultimately going to be enough for us just to insist that the, that the domain of a continuous function consists of accumulation points. We also want there to be so many points that we can fit an entire open interval inside of the domain near one of the points at which we say f is to be continuous. So that led us to this conversation about how to define what it is for a set to be an open set. So the definition was first that we define what it means for a point to be an interior point of a set. And the definition says that a point of E is an interior point if there exists a positive number C such that an entire open interval of radius C, so A minus C to A plus C around this point, is entirely contained within E itself. And so on the x-axis, the picture here, is that the, the set E, the domain of my function, is an open set. If around A, I can find an entire open interval even if that open interval has to be very, very small, very narrow, I can find an entire open interval of points, all of which are contained inside of E. So in other words, E not only contains infinitely many points that are close to A, but in fact it contains an entire open interval uh, centered at A, which is contained entirely within the set E. So that was our definition for interior point. And then we tagged onto the end of that to say that an open set is exactly a set all of whose points are interior points. So an open set is going to be one in which every one of its points has an open interval around it, which is contained entirely within that set. And then we looked at a couple of examples uh, of, of sets that were open uh, that unfortunately were erased in the middle of the class. Um, but we can see some other examples of this elsewhere in the video stream. So we just went through the point of, uh, of just applying this definition to figure out which points of a given set were interior and which ones were not. Okay. So then we tagged that back to the definition of continuity. The one that we started with in our previous class. Previously, we were understanding continuity using the limit definition, saying that a function is continuous at x equals a if, as we approach a, as x approaches a, the limit of the function exists and is equal to the value of the function. In other words, the limit of f of x as x approaches a agrees with the value of f of a. If we were to expand that out using the definition of the limit of a function, we could also write that as saying that for all epsilon greater than zero, we can find a delta greater than zero such that all x which are within a distance of zero and delta of a will satisfy that the distance between f of x and f of a is less than epsilon. So however close we want the values of f to get to f of a, we can make the values be that close by making the values of x be within a delta's reach of the point a. So that was the limit definition that we started our whole conversation about continuity with earlier. But because the notion of an open interval is embedded right here within this definition, in other words, what we're really saying here is we're making a, a claim that x belongs to the open interval a minus delta to a plus delta, and f of x belongs to the open interval f of a minus epsilon to f of a plus epsilon. This definition of open set interior point is embedded secretly within this limit definition. So what that leads us to do is to conjecture this theorem. And we think of this theorem as the open set definition of continuity. And the idea behind it is that when we say that we want f of x to be within an epsilon's reach of f of a, we're requiring that f of x reside within an open interval of a radius epsilon around f of a. And the claim is for a continuous function, we can get f of x values in that open interval by choosing x values that are within this other, smaller perhaps, whatever, open interval on the x-axis. In other words, if you give me an open interval centered at f of a, I can give you an open interval centered at a, all of whose points map inside of your open interval. And how we communicate that in the open set definition of continuity is we say that f is continuous at x equals a if for all epsilon greater than zero, 
the preimage of the open interval, f of a minus epsilon to f of a plus epsilon, by the way, preimage means the set of all x values for which f of x is in this interval. In other words, in our picture, in our graph, it would be the set of all points on the x-axis whose y values are within this interval on the y-axis. And the definition, uh, or rather the theorem, says that for all epsilon greater than zero, the preimage of this open interval will contain an open interval around A of radius delta for some value of delta that's greater than zero. So an another way to think about this might be continuity satisfies the property that the preimage of an open interval will contain an open interval. We can't just map in preimage. We can't map a whole open interval to a point, or we can't map an open interval to something that has gaps in it. Um, one thing we're going to do next week is we're going to play around with these definitions and apply them to some examples of functions that are not continuous to see the ways in which they can break down. But if we want continuity to be true, the preimage of an open interval needs to contain an open interval. And then the last thing that we did, last but not least, um, is we sort of talked about uh, what are these properties of openness and closeness, and how do they interact with one another? Um, once we define what it means for a set to be an open set, there's also a way for us to use that definition to define what it means for a set to be closed as well. And the definition that I prefer is that a closed set is exactly one whose complement is an open set. So if I take an open set and then I look at all the points that are not in that set, what I get there is by definition a closed set. Um, and the various relationships that exist between openness and closeness can be encapsulated within a couple of theorems that we're not really going to have time to explore in too much depth, which might be useful along the way. Namely, it says that if I take finitely many open sets and I intersect them together, then the result is going to be an open set. And if I take any number of open sets and I take their union, then I'm also going to get an open set in that process. So this is one tool that allows us to create new open sets from old open sets. We can take finite intersections of them, or we can take a union of infinitely many of them if we want to. So that's one really important theorem. And actually, this theorem in some context, in the context of a point set topology class, for example, is actually intrinsic to the definition of what it means for a set to be open. Uh, for us, because we've defined openness in the particular way that we have, we're going to take this as a theorem instead. Um, and then the second theorem relates to closeness. Uh, an alternate way of defining what it means for a set to be closed is not just that it's the complement of an open set, which is a definition that I prefer, but you can also define a closed set as one which contains all of its accumulation points. Remember, accumulation points of a set can come from outside the set. So a point doesn't have to belong to E to be an accumulation point of E. But if it's true that all accumulation points of E do come from within the set E, then we call that set closed. So this is the set of ideas that we're going to be playing around with uh, over the next couple of classes as we round out the semester. We want to think about how the limit definition of continuity is satisfied or not satisfied by some examples, um, how the open set definition is satisfied or not satisfied through looking at some examples, and then last but not least, we're also going to look at the sequence definition of continuity uh, and see how it's also telling the same story that the limit definition and that the open set definition are both telling. Um, and just to look at the sequence definition to wrap up, we say that a function is continuous at x equals a if any sequence of x values whose limit converges to a will satisfy that the limit of the y values of those points on the graph will also be a convergent sequence, and not only that, they will converge to the value f of a. So these are our three faces of continuity. We want the limit to exist and equal the value. We want the preimage of every open set to be an open set. and we want any sequence of x values which converges to a to be associated with y values that converge to f of a. We're going to play around with these definitions both when they're satisfied and also some cases where they're not satisfied in our next couple of classes. And that's going to be how we round out this semester. By pulling examples of continuous functions, applying these definitions, is going to require us to reach all the way back through the semester at some of what we learned about sequences in goal number two, um, and also even all the way back to goal number one, where we're thinking about properties of the real numbers and completeness and density and all of that wonderful stuff is all going to come together in this last work that we do for the next couple of days. So this is going to provide a real sort of um, cherry on the, on the Sunday uh, that is our first semester of real analysis.